All right, welcome everybody to the first either annual or semi-annual uh, presentational speaking showcase. So uh, this is an idea, I think um, Megan and Kujan both kind of might, might have brought it up at the same time, uh, and we decided to run with it this semester, which is basically to bring together the best speeches as voted on by the class from each of the 10 sections of presentational speaking uh, this semester so that we could all get in the same room and see these wonderful speeches together. So here are our speakers today, and each faculty member will come up and introduce um, the speaker that's from their class before. So I'll introduce Sarah in just a minute here. So we have 10 speeches. The idea is we'll probably do five and take a short break and then come back and do five more, and then we'll vote. And uh, we will vote by a high-tech applause meter operated <laughs> by Professor Shane Tilton right there. And I'm told the applause meter is objective and infallible. So we will have a perfect uh, solution at the end of the night to who is the champion presentational speaker. But really, this is a competition, but it's also a showcase. These are all wonderful speeches. Each student uh, won a $50 gift for winning their class competition and the winner tonight will receive an extra $100 prize. So it's uh, both you know, educational and potentially lucrative. <laughs> so <laughs> as you are watching the speeches, you know, you can applause or applaud based on whatever you want, but here are some suggested things to think about. One is the persuasive argument. These are all persuasive speeches aimed at convincing all of you to do or think something new or different. So is it thoughtful? Are you convinced by the argument? The con composition of the speech, you know, how did the speech flow? How was the structure? Is it a good argument? Was the case made sensibly? And finally, delivery. Was it polished, appropriate, and engaging? And so in our classes we teach, you know, not only how to deliver a good speech, but how to put one together, and this persuasive speech kind of brings everything together as a major project. And so uh, we will get started right now with our first speaker, Sarah Gilbert. So come on up, Sarah. Sarah um, is going to be talking about banned books, and you can wait and see whether she's for or against it. <laughs> and Sarah Handley um, won the competition for her class. It was, you know, there were a lot of speeches that got votes, but um, Sarah took it, and it was a clear victory, and I think you'll see that. It's a wonderful speech. All right, Sarah, take it away. Well, hello, I'm Sarah, and my speech today is on banned books. So when I first gave this speech, I asked everybody in our class when they thought this picture was taken. And the closest guess was 2007, which actually wasn't very close because this is an image of a book banning, book burning in Tennessee on February 2nd, 2022. So that was just a little over a year ago, and book banning and burning is just getting worse. Book banning, challenging, and censorship censorship are still a problem in the United States, and these are being challenged for a broad range of reasons. In this speech, I will inform you on the reasons why books are banned, what types of books are most commonly banned, and why books should not be banned from schools, libraries, or bookstores. And also, the state and national government should not be able to ban a book or change its content. So, books are being banned from schools and libraries for a variety of reasons. Most because they have LGBTQ content, have content relating to racial inequality, religious inequality, activism, and sex education. People that are in support of book banning are saying that these books include content that is inappropriate for children to read. Some common words they have used to describe these books found by the American Library Association are that these books are misleading, inappropriate, biased, controversial, go against traditional family values, don't reflect the values of our community, and much more. But the one common phrase that I found, and the most interesting phrase I found, was that many people describe these books as confusing. I found that banning a book because it's confusing is pretty illogical. Why would you ban or censor a book without fully understanding what it is you are doing? 
Banning books keeps children from learning about different life perspectives and diversity and keeps them from learning about different cultures and beliefs. According to the Intercultural Development, Re Development Research Association, this limits a child's ability to have in-depth conversations about controversial topics and it keeps them from being able to connect with their students of different ethnicities and cultures. This also may harm children that identify as a minority and keep them from connecting with their peers. One of the most interesting examples I found in a banned book, in a banned book was the book Fahrenheit 451, which was written in response to the book bannings and burnings during World War II. This, ironically, is a banned book about the harm of banning books. In the recent popularity in book banning has similarities to other times in history as well. Book bannings and burnings have been held by certain groups throughout history as a means of censorship in, of information and to keep people from learning more and enforcing certain ideals onto a population. The most famous example of book banning and censorship was during Nazi in Nazi Germany during World War II. And according to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, during World War II and leading up to World War II, Germany was responsible for the burning of thousands of books that were deemed, quote, un-German because they were written by leftist, Jewish, or liberal authors. This was done to limit the amount of information that the German community was getting and also to force a common worldview onto them. These books, quote, were not reflecting the traditional value, oops, sorry, these books were not reflecting the traditional values of the German community, and these books were burned and their authors were blacklisted. This may be an extreme example of censorship, but as Winston Churchill stated, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Book banning actually also goes against the First Amendment according to two court cases. According to PEN America, a nonprofit organization that supports the right of expression through literary works, the court case Tinker v. Des Moines Independent Community School District, a case that took place during the controversy of the Vietnam War, states that all students retain their First Amendment rights while in school, and under a second case, the Board of Education of the Island Tree Union Free School District v. PICO, banning books in junior high and high schools goes against the First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and freedom of press which means that the Board of Education had no right to ban these books and restrict their access. Banning books is not only the problem because books are also being censored, and this doesn't just apply to fictional or dystopian books, but to textbooks as well. Textbooks around the US and the world are adapting their content to leave out important information. For example, the Florida government has been adapting their grade school history textbooks to leave out incidences of racial inequality, ableism, and other things. In this example, the government changed the story of Rosa Parks. In the original textbook, it states that she was asked to move to a different seat because of the color of her skin, and she refused. Under the new revision, it says that she was told to move to a new seat and didn't. Here, the textbook is now leaving out a crucial part of this historical story, and through the omission of these facts, it is trying to change important parts of our history. Now, many people argue that banning books and censorship is a good idea because these books may sway the minds of their children, and others argue that reading these books exposes them to inappropriate content that will harm them in the future and have long-term damaging effects. But banning books is not the solution. Yes, there might be some content that is difficult for children to understand or hear, but this is why parents need to have open conversations with their children about what they're reading. These conversations may be difficult to have with your children, but just banning these books pushes these conversations off to a later date and ignores the problems. Banning books can actually be harmful as well because it does not allow, it then allows children not to form their own viewpoints and it inhibits their ability to empathize with others. Banning books also doesn't remove their child's access to this tech, to this content because information like this and worse can be found on the internet. It is much easier for these parents to have difficult conversations with their student with their students and children now than for their children to turn to the internet for help. 
It is also important for these children to have access to stories that are different from their own experiences so that we as a country and a civilization can grow. It is important to foster these ideas so that children are able to problem solve and have difficult and intelligent conversations in the future. Limiting a child's access to the book can only cause more problems, which is why I believe that books should not be banned, but in a culture where we are growing more and more reliant on technology, I think that reading books, old and new, should be encouraged. Books show the power of words and actions, and reading them can increase your vocabulary, comprehension of different topics, ability to empathize, creativity, communication skills, and much more. Reading about social injustices, whether fictional or non-fictional, can help younger generations create a better environment for which they want to live in, and helps people face injustices. Finally, I would just like to add some interesting reactions to book banning and book burning and censorship, and one very empowering reaction was through the banning and burning of the book The Handmaid's Tale. Margaret Atwood's book has been banned for years in the United States for having difficult topics. But she likes to emphasize that everything that she wrote about in that book has happened somewhere to somebody and, has the, and there is the potential that it could happen again in the future. Her reaction to not only the banning of her book but also the burning of her book was to create the unburnable book. This is a copy of her book that has been printed on fire-resistant paper with fireproof ink and has a fire retardant cover. She also did a promotional stunt where she took a blowtorch to her own book and showed that it couldn't be burned and that the power of words can never be extinguished. This copy of her book sold for $130,000 and all proceeds went to help the freedom of expression. Another reaction to the censorship of information was the creation of the uncensored library. Many countries censor their news articles and information they allow the public to see, and in these countries, being a reporter can even be criminalized. That is why many journalists, reporters, and advocates of free information have converted all of their news and information that has been banned into books that can be seen and viewed in Minecraft, which is a game that is still allowed in many of these countries due to its popularity. Banning books is not only harmful, but unlawful, and these actions discriminate against and censor books containing to LGBTQ topics, racial inequality, religious inequality, activism, and sex education. While banning books may seem like a smart idea to shield their children from exposing, to shield children and keep them from exposing them to inappropriate things, it just creates more problems in the long term. Books should not be banned, and I also encourage parents to read the books that their children are reading at the same time as them so they can have conversations about what they're reading. Reading banned books does not harm children, and if you don't believe me, here are all the banned books I have read, and I turned out to be a high-achieving college student <laughs> that is in the athletics and honors program. Thank you. and I'll be talking about the need for CPR training. According to the American Heart Association, 
36,000 citizens pass away from cardiac arrest each year, most of which happen outside of hospitals, causing higher life-threatening situations. What would you do if you witnessed a cardiac arrest? As adults, we should be willing to learn CPR in case a loved one, friend, or even stranger falls into sudden cardiac arrest. Performing CPR can double or even triple a person's likelihood of surviving, as noted by the American Heart Association. Saving someone else's life with CPR is an act of duty you will never forget. So here is a picture of the main letters to remember for CPR. Uh, C stands for compressions, A is airway, B is breathing, and on the right is a picture of a pocket mask, which is recommended to use when giving CPR, and you can get one for around $6. By taking a course here on campus, I have learned the importance and skills of CPR. I received in-depth training on how to perform quality chest compressions and rescue breaths on infants and adults. With the help of local CPR classes and incentives, more people will have access to training and a desire to learn the necessary life-saving skills. First, let's look at the significance of CPR. More people should take a CPR course to understand how to save someone who is experiencing cardiac arrest. Compared to the number of individuals, individuals that face cardiac arrest, not enough citizens know what to do when someone's heart stops. Corliss, an executive editor through the Harvard Medical School, mentions that fewer than half of people who experience cardiac arrest outside of a hospital receive CPR from someone nearby. That means that over half of those who suddenly experience heart failure do not receive any help. Corliss further states, although 65% of people in the United States say they've received CPR training at some point in their lives, only 18% of people are up to date on their training. Just over half of Americans are familiar with CPR, but over time, those skills vanish. So it is important to keep your certification up to date by taking the course. Now that we understand the need for CPR, let's, transition, er, let's discuss training improvements. More local CPR courses with attached incentives should be available to the public. With more nearby classes and rewards given to those who register, citizens will have easier access and motivation to learn CPR. Knowing CPR during cardiac arrest is like knowing what to do when the fire alarm goes off. Both happen unexpectedly, but your actions can result in a life or death situation. Local CPR courses offer a learning environment with familiar people who all share the same goal. Various types of rewards can be given, such as free t-shirts, coupons, or tickets to events, to name a few. People will be more likely to register for a CPR class knowing that they will not have to travel far and will benefit from the time they give. According to Gaffar, a member of Saudi Board of Community and Preventative Medicine, the American Heart Association in Emergency Cardiovascular Care set a goal to train millions of people globally every year by educating the public on how to respond to cardiac arrest and first aid emergencies. This will empower community participation and increase the rate of survival among patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Since the two organizations want to educate more people on CPR, more local training courses should be offered each year to fulfill their goal. Rewarding those in local CPR courses can help inspire the population. In an article written by Silver Platz, who's in the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care in Sweden, says, in the event of a possible cardiac arrest situation, 61% of healthcare professionals would feel confident in their CPR knowledge. 86% would know what to do, and 60% would be able to take command if necessary. These are people who take care of patients, so they should have a higher confidence in performing CPR. The key to surviving cardiac arrest is essentially CPR. If more local courses were offered with the reward for those who attended, 
more healthcare workers and people nearby would take advantage of the opportunity. More people taking the class leads to more citizens feeling confident with CPR. Now that we know the importance of CPR, let me paint your picture. It is a sunny, warm summer day, and your grandma asks you to help her go grocery shopping at the local store. You go with her, and while shopping, she suddenly falls to the floor. You yell and ask her if she's okay, but she does not respond. She lies unconscious. You scream for help, and a few people run over with concern and worry. Time is ticking, and your grandma's precious life is on the line. No one knows what to do, and everyone is flustered. Thankfully, you took a CPR course recently, so you check for a pulse, begin chest compressions, and give rescue breaths. You perform CPR until EMS arrives. Ultimately, you are the reason your grandma is still here. You are thankful you learned CPR since it was vital to a loved one right in front of you. You think back to the situation that day and wonder why no one else has started CPR. Maybe they had never learned how, Maybe they were too nervous, or maybe they simply did not feel confident enough to perform it. You then look at the bigger picture and realize your town does not offer any courses. This poses a concern for people's physical needs if they face cardiac arrest. In addition, people's safety and medical needs are at risk, which can affect someone you share a connection with. If your town had offered a CPR class, there would have been a greater chance people in that store could have assisted in saving your family's life. Lastly, let's look at ways and how you can take action to learn CPR. More individuals should become educated in CPR through a local class near their hometown. You never know when someone will collapse from cardiac arrest. By having a CPR certification, you can save their life. Register now for a CPR course. In-person classes are best because you must learn hands-on skills to obtain your certification. The course takes just a little over two hours to become certified for two years. A few hours of your day could save many hours of someone else's life. Another option is to register now for medical emergency management here at ONU. It's a three credit hour course offered in the spring or fall. You will learn all the necessary CPR skills for adults and infants. I'm in the course right now, and we spent about three weeks practicing CPR for our hands-on certification test. Let's all be willing to save a life. You never know. The favor may be returned one day. It's my pleasure and honor to uh, bring to the stage Mason Cruze, who is a language arts education major from Westlake, Ohio. One of the reasons that he was selected to represent Section 2 of, of Presentation Speaking is because what we look for in a persuasive speech is those that not only can give a dynamic speech that focus on the rhetorical traditions, but to tell a story in a way that uses emotion and thoughtfulness. So with that being said, Mason will come up and talk about Southerns. Thank you, Dr. Tilton, and thank you to everyone who came out here tonight. My presentation is over cell phone addiction, and I'm willing to bet that most of the phones in here are below 40% battery right now. Maybe even below 20. Maybe you've had to charge it already today. I can't tell you how many times someone my age has to plug in their phone, and I'm like, it's 3 p.m. They say, well, I've been on TikTok. <laughs> Cell phone addiction is a growing problem, and we seem to be using them obsessively. We depend on them for everything, and they're taking over in-person social interaction. Now, I'm not going to suggest switching to a flip phone or deleting all of your social media. But I am going to challenge you to evaluate your cell phone usage and to cut down on your screen time. 
Now, I spent lots of time researching this topic, and I'd like to present why this is a good idea by going over how cell phones are taking over social interaction, how they're affecting our sleep and mental health, and then we'll go over techniques to lessen phone time as well as the benefits of doing so. So first, social interaction. The cell phone is taking away from the true, valuable, in-person social interaction. A 2020 Ukrainian study published in the journal Psychiatric Quarterly says that there's an increased occurrence in fubbing. This is a combination of the words phone and snubbing, and it's used to describe when you're in an in-person social interaction and your attention is on your phone rather than on the person who you are supposed to be interacting with. According to this study, fubbing is employed in social interactions because of feelings of loneliness or social anxiety, and the cell phone addiction fuels this. It's our instinct to pull out the phone. We don't even think about it. And while this seems to make us more comfortable, it actually increases the feelings of loneliness and anxiety, making us all the more likely to turn back to the phone. The person who we're with in the in-person social interaction, they may be more likely to turn to their phone as well because they, be, they begin to feel left out. It's an endless cycle. In its final results, this study showed a positive correlation between phone addiction-fueled fubbing and depression in college students. This shows how this addiction is affecting our mental health. Social media is how most of us spend our time on the phone. A 2022 article published in the journal Perspectives in Psychiatric Care says that higher social media addiction levels and compulsive internet use equate to worse mental health. Subjects showed high levels of depression and anxiety. This article says, quote, social media addiction can affect the extent of loneliness sensed by individuals. Since social media is such a large part of how we use our cell phones, it is a growing part of this addiction. Now we all know that we need good sleep, and we need a good amount of sleep as well, but our cell phones are usually the last thing that we look at before we go to bed. A 2022 study called Sleep Latency and Sleep Disturbances, published in Sleep and Biological Rhythms, says that the cell phone addiction is the reason that most people use their phones past a target bedtime. We just can't put it down, and this results in less sleep. Social media before bed showed an increase in sleep latency, or the time it took their subjects to fall asleep. It also increased sleep disturbances, and this poor sleep resulted in lower psychological well-being in subjects. I should men mention that conversely, in a 2021 study published in the journal Sleep Medicine, that study says that social media use before bed does not affect sleep quality. But this study negates the effects of blue light from the cell phone, and regardless of the quality of sleep, the addiction takes up time that we should be sleeping, and an insufficient amount of sleep lowers one's mental health. So how do we lessen this addiction? Well, I came across this article in Wired Magazine called Stop the Endless Scroll, and it suggested that we view social media through the desktop website rather than the apps on your phone. Now, I was skeptical of this at first, but I employed this and it worked for me. I found that I was much less likely to endlessly scroll on the desktop website. It's a little less convenient, but this made me not want to endlessly scroll. You see what you want to see and you move on. Another technique is batching smartphone notifications. This is delivering groups of notifications from your phone at scheduled intervals throughout the day, rather than as they come in individually. A 2019 study published in the journal Computers and Human Behavior showed that batching smartphone notifications lowered stress and inattention in their subjects, and it resulted in heightened productivity. This week is exam week. That might be beneficial. 
<laughs> so why? Why are we doing this? Why should we lower our cell phone time? Well, it creates more time for more fulfilling activities. It creates time for more in-person social interaction, or maybe it's something else, like a hobby. Maybe that's movies or reading, but whatever it is, having a hobby is beneficial. A 2019 study published in the British Journal of Occupational Therapy showed that reading or engaging in a hobby is almost as restorative a practice as sleep. So instead of spending our waking hours looking down at a screen and then looking up and wondering where all those hours went, let's do something that we love. Now I've been mostly negative on cell phones, but the truth is they can be useful tools. We've made great strides in communication. We can have all of our music in our pockets and we have the internet at our fingertips. It's when we misuse them that problems happen. In conclusion, the cell phone addiction takes away time from valuable in-person social interaction. It can lead to poor sleep and it can be harmful to your mental health. We've gone over ways to subside the addiction and the benefits of doing so, including time to engage in a hobby. I hope you're all now more inspired to take a close look at how you're using your cell phone and perhaps cut back the time a little bit. Let's continue to use phones for the tools they should be and not let them run our lives. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I'd like to introduce to you this evening our next speaker, Daniel McDonald. Now Daniel is a freshman here and he's in the computer sciences program, but I can say that uh, he truly loves his dogs as members of the family. And just to go off side note a little bit, we allow our students uh, to choose the topic of their presentation. And one of the reasons we do that is we want them to have enthusiasm and passion for their subject because if, if they're not passionate about the subject, how do you hope to uh, endear and, and enthuse your audience? So I know for a fact that Daniel's very passionate about the subject that he's about to present. So with that, welcome Daniel McDonald. Clicker not up there? Hang on. Do you guys like dogs? Because I, I have two dogs at home, and all the pets I've had over the years, they've all been adopted. It's pretty much going to be related to what we're going to talk, talk about today. So my name is Dan McDonald, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the dangers of commercial things like a dog, right? We're going to be discussing some of the health effects that selective dog breeding has on dogs. We're going to be talking about uh, how humans have changed dog breeds over the past hundred years. And we're going to be talking about uh, some of the ethical and moral issues related to commercial dog breeding. And on top of that, I'm going to be talking about some of the counter arguments that can be made for commercial dog breeding. So first thing I'm going to be talking about some of the health issues that can come with selective dog breeding. But before that, I should probably tell you what selective dog breeding when I say selective dog breeding, I mean breeding a dog to enhance a certain feature, whether it's longer fur, shorter legs, anything like that. But over the years of inbreeding and trying to reach the perfect standard of what a dog should be, we've distorted dogs in dangerous ways that cause numerous health effects in numerous different breeds. And in an article titled, Evaluation of the Influence of Kyphosis and Scoliosis on the Intervertebral Disc Distortion in French Bulldogs, they studied 178 French Bulldogs. And out of those 178 dogs, 77 of them had spinal issues. That's over 44% of the dogs. And if you expand that to the entire breed, you can see there's a clear correlation between spinal issues and dog breeds. 
and in an article titled A Flawed Beauty, they talk about the select history of selective breeding and how it affects dogs. And they say that the Victorian era's people, as they switch their expectations of dogs from functionality, how fast they can go, how well they can hunt, but to appearance, they began to favor distorted features such as larger heads, shorter bodies, flatter faces, and all of these features decrease a dog's quality of life just for a slight increase in attractiveness to humans. And that's just some of the negative health effects that selective breeding can cause. But I think it's important to understand how quickly humans can change a breed. And because once humans understood that they can change a dog breed within just a few generations, they went wild. So I'm going to show you some pictures of how dogs have changed over the years, past around 100 years. So first up is the French Bulldog that I mentioned before. And if you know what a French Bulldog looks like, you could probably still tell me that's a French Bulldog. Even though it was 100 years ago, they look pretty similar. But there are some key differences in the model. This is how it looks like today. See, you can see that it has a flatter face, which can lead to breathing issues as its nose is constricted and can be hard to breathe. It has a shorter body and shorter legs. And the shorter body and shorter legs is what can cause the spinal issues that I mentioned before. And all of these features have been specifically bred over the years to make this that we see today. Then the next breed up is one of the most disturbing and drastic changes I've seen in dog breed, probably the most disturbing I've seen. And it's the Bull Terrier. If you know the mascot for Target, it's that dog. This is how it looked like 100 years ago. It looks like a fairly normal dog. I mean, there's not really anything I could see that would cause some crazy health issue, but that, the same cannot be said for the modern version. So that is how it looks like today. It's, trained, it's changed drastically, and if you show me this dog compared to the one 100 years ago, I wouldn't be able to tell you that the same dog. It has a drastically different head shape, it looks almost like a football, and its body is a much different shape, and it, it really shows you how quickly humans can change a dog breed this much. And then the final breed I'll show you is the English Bulldog, which is coincidentally the mascot for Ada High School. This is how it looked like 100 years ago. And it doesn't look too bad 100 years ago. It looks a little short. It's pretty strong. It has wrinkles. That's a pretty uh, common thing for the breed. And this is how it looks like today. So its wrinkles are much more pronounced. And in certain cases, it can even cover their eyes, making it harder to see. It has a much flatter face, which again leads to breathing issues. And it has a short body and shorter legs. It's a very common thing among uh, small dog breeds. It will be shorter body, shorter legs, flatter face. And all of these features have been bred to make it look more attractive to some people. I don't get it, but some people do. <laughs> and in an article titled The Fall and Rise of the English Bulldog, they have a very good quote about bulldogs. They say, Bulldogs like train wrecks and house fires are hard to ignore. All of these bred dogs have been bred specifically to increase physical deformities, and all of these deformities decrease their quality of life significantly just for a slight increase in how they look to their humans. And now that, now, that you've been, now that I've shown you how the selective breeding has changed breeds and how it causes numerous health effects, it's important to understand how commercial breeding has many ethical and moral issues. So when I say commercial breeding, I mean, companies that will treat dogs like products and like tools, they'll just breed them, send them to the customer, and then it's done. So, in an article titled, Turn Up the Volume on Man's Best Friend, Ethical Issues Associated with Commercial Dog Breeding, they make a good point in that dogs, for most of human history, have been considered man's best friend. They've evolved alongside us for millennia. But as, we can, as commercial breeding increases in popularity, we trivialize our unique relationship to dogs as friends, family members, companions, and we treat them more as commodities, products, tools. Dogs don't need to be art pieces, perfect, perfect statues of what a dog should be. They're meant to be loved and cared for and played with. But as we can, as commercial breeding increases, we just continue to trivialize that relationship. And there are some more ethical issues associated with commercial breeding because. We're still not fully sure of many of the conditions within commercial kennels. And the few times we do get to know these conditions, it's often not good. And there are many commercial breeders that will give consumers designer dogs, pretty much. They'll breed together certain dogs, send them out, train them like tools. 
it's it really just de we detach ourselves from the notion that dogs are friends and family members and treat them as objects. And now, what everything I've set up to this point, I think it's a good point, but there are still some very valid counter arguments that can be made for commercial breeding. One such, uh, the, mo the most important argument I, I can say that can be made for commercial breeding is simply that people need dogs. Dogs are one of, if not the most uh, valued uh, pet across the entire world. And people need a steady supply of dogs. And if we don't uh, identify an uh, ethical and efficient solution to commercial breeding, we'll just be leaving a void for something worse to come. And on this point, I completely agree. If we don't identify an uh, effective solution to uh, commercial dog breeding, we'll just create something worse. But that's why I'm not arguing for the elimination of commercial dog breeding, but rather stricter regulations on dog breeding. We need to ensure that dogs' welfare is a top priority instead of profit. Because these commercial dog breeders, will, they're, they're a for-profit business, if you think about it. They're not, dogs are just a number on a piece of paper. Profit is their main concern. But if we impose regulations on them, and ensure that the dog's welfare is the most important thing. So, after all this, I hopefully you can see some of the dangers of commercial and selective dog breeding, and can understand that it causes numerous health effects within dogs. It trivializes our relationship that we have with dogs, making them commodities, and it makes them more like a product. We treat them as an art piece instead of a friend. So, you might be wondering, what can I do as just an audience member, as a consumer? Well, when you go to get a dog, any animal, don't go to a breeder, some big commercial place. One example being like Petsmart. There have been many allegations over the years about not treating their animals correctly. Instead, you should go to a shelter or even adopt a stray animal. I mean, all of my dogs over the years have been strays from a shelter, and it's a much more ethical <coughs> solution to it. Don't support these commercial breeders. And instead, you should just, if you see a big dog on the street all alone, left by someone just left on the side of the road, pick them up, take them home. Non-purebred dogs are just as deserving of love and home and care as purebred dogs. And now, to end the speech, I'm just gonna show you a couple pictures of my dogs. Here's Jeeves. He's part Cordy and part 20 other dogs. I'm not fully sure all of them are. And that's Felix. He's part part lab and part, again, 20 other dogs. And they're just as loving as any other dog. So I'm just gonna end this speech by saying, dogs, no matter what they are, are deserving of love and care in a home. It doesn't matter how purebred or what breed they are. They're deserving of a home. That's all.
teacher in an elementary school. Wake up one morning ex to head to work, expecting to have a successful day, teaching your students the lesson plans that you spent your whole week in planning and helping your students. Just when you think it's gonna be a stress-free day, one of your students has a meltdown and takes off running through the halls. Amidst being in the middle of a lesson, you have to stop what you're doing, leave all of your other students behind, and chase the little rug rat down. Other staff and teachers help you along the way, but it doesn't end there. Once you track the child down, they reel their arm back and punch another teacher in the stomach, knocking the breath out of them. Sounds like a pretty successful day at work, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, this is the reality for many teachers in the Marion City Schools District. This is an ongoing issue in this district that has progressively worsened over the past few years. Education systems are hurting and it's only projected to get worse if change is not made. As someone who has gone through this school system and has a mother who's been teaching for 22 plus years in the district, I've gained a lot of insight as I've been around this staff for many years. It is time that staff, parents, community members, and school officials rally to advocate for more discipline in schools. As teachers are not paid to be babysitters, schools are losing exponential amounts of faculty, and out of hope for our future community. To better understand why more discipline is needed, it is imperative that we first understand the role of teachers and what they endure, the effects of exponential faculty loss, and how these kids are being impacted so that we can discuss a potential solution and to gain justice for our teachers. So to begin, let's discuss the role of teachers. The dictionary definition of an educator is a person who provides instruction or education, a teacher. Notice that nowhere in that definition does it say that a teacher is a babysitter. Now I don't mean for this to come off as harsh and heartless that a teacher should just show up, teach the lesson, and go back home. Teachers do play a big role in child development aside from education. My mom, a third grade teacher for 20 years, explains that she always tries to be there for her students because she understands that many of them don't get to go home to a loving family or let alone a home at all. But she knows for that time that she's in their, they're in her classroom, she can give them every ounce of love. So although teachers have a bigger role than just teaching, they're not there to babysit. At the end of the day, they have a job to do. Also, their job becomes draining. Mental health is a big issue today, and I understand that many students struggle, which could be the reason for the behavior. But we also have to think about our teachers and be there for them. We must be reminded that teachers have lives outside of the school too, whether that's their own children that they're dealing with, other jobs, family issues, and so on. In a book about psychology of education, researchers explain that lack of discipline is a huge stressor for teachers. Now obviously dealing with discipline comes with the job, but when it becomes draining to the point of burnout for teachers, that can become an issue. It is more the fact that nothing is being done to correct the behavior, leaving teachers exhausted with having to deal with it on a regular basis. Because, student, because teachers are being forced to deal with this behavior, leaving them drained, a lot of teachers are leaving the district, causing schools to lose faculty and community members. One of the biggest issues in my mom's school district is the lack of bus drivers. If you go to the Marion City Schools website, you can find the different bus schedules. After talking with my mom, she explained that many days they have to go on two hour delays or two hour early releases to ensure that bus drivers can get all the students to school. Now, if a parent has to drop a student off at a normal time because they have to be at work, that's allowed. However, a teacher's not allowed to begin any instruction until all students are in the class. There was also several articles. Okay, we're missing a picture. Anyway, there's also several articles in the Marion Star newspaper about how 43 teachers left the district in just a single year. This includes longtime principals, teachers, and other faculty. My mom even told me stories that teachers were leaving in the middle of the year due to feeling like they weren't heard because of the lack of discipline. There have also been families and community members that are in good standing and 
very active in the school that have left after years of being there and taking their, school, their children to other schools in the county after all of the issues that we've had. So along with it causing our teachers to leave, to, along with it causing our teachers to leave and draining them, it's just simply making their job harder. Obviously, it's disruptive because it takes time away from students that are behaving. If a teacher must chase a student down the halls or escort a student out, call a parent about an issue, or even just take the time to get a student back on track, that's time away from students that are just simply sitting there. Essentially, other students can also become distracted as well, not just because of what's happening in that moment, but if they see that this behavior is consistently occurring with no punishment, they may begin to act out as well. Overall, teachers are there to help progress students in their education and lives. According to the Ohio Report Card, the district is not performing well overall in their test scores or making significant progress in several different uh, subjects, third grade and up. So the schools are already hurting academically. Overall, this district is hurting due to the lack of solutions for our teachers and lack of discipline. I hope you now understand why more discipline is needed. It is imperative that we understand what these teachers go through and what their role is, effects of exponential faculty loss, and how these children are being impacted so that we can discuss a potential solution and gain justice for teachers. It is time that staff, parents, community members, and school officials make a change and rally to advocate for more discipline in order to help better the future of the kids, community, and staff. I cannot encourage you all enough to be present in the board meetings, make your voices heard and vote on academic decisions, participate in school functions, and teach your children to behave and to respect their teachers. Your teachers deserve to be able to do their job and help your children grow. These kids are our future community, future leaders, future workers, and future friends. It is so vital that we maximize their education experience and not hold them back.
Following along a similar theme, as she was exiting high school, she released Fearless in 2008, an album, as it says, about her being fearless. This is her entering the music industry and figuring out who she is, and she's going to be fearless about it. Then, another two years later, she released Speak Now. This branched into some aspects that people didn't think she was going to. She kind of stayed true to country before then, and now she finally was branching into some pop aspects, kind of sh shifting gears a little bit, and this album was about her story throughout love and her young romance and kind of growing up into adulthood. Once again, with another bold statement, she released Red. Another two years later, of course, this album completely shifted things once again. Not only was she able to culminate the genres of the previous three albums, but she was able to branch out into a couple more things that hadn't been done yet before. And it left people questioning what Taylor Swift was doing, where did she belong? But that's exactly what she, where she belonged, everywhere. Taylor Swift was able to branch out into anything she felt that she needed to. And then, 2014. 1989 came out. This is a callback to her birth year, obviously, and this is a fully pop album. Not really mixing it up a little bit, but you have to remember, 2014, we're all listening to Ed Sheeran, Ariana Grande, The Chainsmokers, and of course, Taylor Swift. She knew when to release a pop album and when to release some top hits. With Blank Space and Shake It Off, how can you hate that? Then, a couple years later, she shifts it up completely once again. With Reputa Reputation, this album branched into some EDM punk pop kind of vibes that people did not think was going to be what Taylor Swift was doing. This was stemmed around some controversy at the time where people didn't really uh, agree with a lot of things Taylor Swift was doing. As I said, controversy was happening and she just was holding that teen angst that she had and establishing that she's doing what she wants to do. She then released Lover in 2019, my personal favorite album. This is an ethereal album with a dream pop and synth pop vibe that just kind of talks about her experiences with love and her journey throughout it and kind of her opinion about it. She really sings about it. I love this album. She then released Folklore and Evermore in 2020 in the midst of COVID. Uh, and these albums were a little bit on the sad side, as they sound. They were, they were full, independent works that kind of established that she's human, she's made mistakes, and she's not afraid to be vulnerable when she needs to be. And that's basically what these two albums established. And then finally, she released Midnight's in 2022. Another pop album, Taylor knew what she was doing, releasing these pop songs to get everybody moving and grooving when she needed. And honestly, just one of my favorite albums once again as well. Now I know what you're wondering, Jake, you're just naming her albums. This has nothing to do with her being the greatest artist of our generation. But the answer is right in front of us. Not only is she able to release songs like Red later in her career, staying true to her country roots, but even early on, releasing a song like Picture to Burn, branching into some rock. And as I said, she can switch it up. The Way I Love You branched into contemporary, and Mean branched into some bluegrass as well. But once again, as I said, she can release a pop song when she needs one like me, and even switch it up with some angst with a little bit of a blank space. Statistically, Taylor Swift is sweeping the categories. With 59 billion streams, she is the most streamed wooden art woman artist on any platform. That's absurd. Billion with a B. On top of that, she's the first artist to hold all 10 tracks on the Billboard Top 100. This was from her Midnight's album. And this was also the first artist to ever do that. And this leads me into my next point of her winning 12 Grammys, 14 MTV Awards, and nearly 100 Guinness World Records. There are artists that are barely scraping these numbers to get here. Now, all this did not come without controversy. I want to start off with the ownership of her music. Now, when her record label expired, she kind of struggled with who was going to be buying it. And a third party came in, swept under, and bought it from her to where she didn't have ownership of her first six albums. Um, obviously, somebody who wrote their own songs and performs their own songs should have ownership of their album and their, their works, but she did not, of course. Uh, she then figured out that she was able to re-record those first six albums, gain credit for those first six albums, and gain revenue from those first six albums. That also stemmed into a little bit of exploitation. As I said, Taylor Swift entered the music industry at a young age, writing her own songs at 12 years old. This did not come without people using her, whether that was for profit, for social gain, or many other things. Taylor Swift was being exploited. And eventually this led to mistreatment. She spoke it open and honestly about hate comments and various things that have kind of put her down in her career. As I said, she's even written songs about being vulnerable to those kind of things. One of the biggest hurdles that Taylor Swift had ever had to tackle was the 2009 VMA Awards. She had won Best Music Video for You Belong With Me, beating out Beyonce's single ladies, which was kind of like an underdog story. People didn't think this was going to happen. This was early on in her career. She was still making a footing, making 
Sure, people knew who she was, and she beat one of the biggest heads in the music industry at the time. But without hesitation, Kanye West stormed the stage, took the microphone from her, and began to defame her accomplishments. The 19-year-old stood up on stage shocked as thousands of people booed Kanye West off the stage, and she didn't know what to do or what to say. I want to reiterate, this is a 19-year-old girl. She's no older than me standing in front of you guys on stage right now and establishing that she was the underdog. She's somebody who was still making her way in this world, in this music industry. And she openly admitted that Kanye West was one of the first music artists that she ever downloaded on her iPod. That he was one of the artists that she looked up to, that she inspired to be. To have somebody like that say that your work wasn't good enough, that you didn't succeed well enough, that you didn't do good enough in what you did, is enough to make anybody tuck their tail between their legs, pack it up, head home, and call it quits. That is not what she did. Six years later, Taylor Swift released three new albums, and she was even bigger than she could have ever imagined. She won Best Music Video once again for Bad Blood, and instead of continuing that bad blood with Kanye West, she squashed it, established that she looked up to him. He has had a great career. She's not going to diss him. She doesn't want controversy with the man. She left the award ceremony that day with her head held high, knowing that she won the award and that it was gone, that she could move on from that very instance. Now, beyond the realm of music, Taylor Swift is not afraid to say what she believes in. She's a huge women's rights activist, and she makes it known in her own court case that she struggled through and established. She makes it known that women can speak up about their issues and make it known that they have a voice. On top of that, she's a large LGBTQ activist, and she makes that known, whether that's in her lyrics, her songs, or even just her style choices in general. Taylor Swift just wants people to know that they can be themselves no matter who they are. And then finally, bouncing off some points I've already made, she's a huge music industry guru. What I mean by that is she's not afraid to put her neck out on the line for the smaller artists that maybe are still struggling through the toxic music industry. And as I said, she's made it known that the music industry is toxic, that there's problems with it, and that there's issues that people aren't afraid to address. But Taylor Swift is not afraid to address those issues. All these things I've announced today are traits of not only a great leader, influencer, and great music artist, but one of the greatest of all time. And if I was given the option to write down who is the greatest music artist of our generation, I've got a blank space, baby, and I'd write her name. <laughs> Sanders. Jessica comes from the world of musical theater and her speeches this semester have taken us through all those different realms of drama, comedy, and everything in between. And this one's about an important social issue. And uh, please welcome Jessica. Hello, everyone. To start, I would like you all to think back to your senior year of high school. Scary time, I know. You've got the stress of classes, senior events, proms, homecomings, clubs and sports, graduation, and on top of all of that, you're having to apply to colleges, scholarships, and try to figure out what you want to even do with your life. It can be a stressful time, but what if you just had the chance to take your senior year as your senior year and worry about college later? That's what I did as a gap year student, and I'm here to say it was one of the best decisions I have ever made. I believe that gap years should be normalized and encouraged among youth. Today, I'll share why and address many of the fears that people might have about taking time off from school. To help you understand the benefits of a gap year, we'll be looking at how it positively affects your goals, academics, and pay. We'll start with goals. This can mean a bunch of different things based on the individual. If you look at studies done on gap years, personal growth is always the biggest reason for taking time off. This graph from a survey of 1,000 gap year students done by the Gap Year Association specifically shows that 96 to 98% of all students surveyed said that their time off gave them time to reflect on themselves, develop as a person, and increase their maturity and self-confidence. And taking time off to pursue hobbies can do wonders for a student's potential. This can be traveling, cooking, hockey, literally anything. 
For example, during my gap year, I decided to take time to sew, which was something I had always been interested in. Taking time to learn that skill not only made me happy, but it gave me the opportunity to get hired as a, as a seamstress for two theater shows that summer. And now, I'm able to work in the costume shop here at ONU. A gap year is also a great time, ooh, excuse me. My PowerPoint doesn't work. We'll continue on. <laughs> a gap year is also a great time to connect with your friends and family and emotionally prepare for moving to college. College. Bestcolleges.com shows that about 70% of students experience homesickness their first year of college. And personally, I was very worried about that since I was moving 18 hours away from my loved ones. So instead of disconnecting from them, I spent every moment I could with them. Having that time with them strengthened our relationships and has made our communication at college stronger and more consistent. It was also just the most fun I had ever had. Which moves us to my next point. Taking a gap year is great for fun and hobbies, but it can also do wonders for students' academics. The Gap Year Association has proven that gap year students have higher GPAs on average and are more involved at college. Not only that, but they have higher job satisfaction after graduation. Not only are students more motivated, but they're more confident in their college decisions. I know I would not have ended up at ONU if I didn't take a gap year. For one, I probably would have never heard of it. And also, even if I did, I probably wouldn't, want, wouldn't have wanted to come here since I thought I wanted to attend some big New York school. Turns out, I love a small college, and I probably would have hated a big one. This dissatisfaction isn't uncommon at all. About one-third of college freshmen do not return to the same institution for a second year. I spoke to Deanna Han at admissions, and she told me that this incoming freshman class this year was made up of 666 students. With, with the statistics I just shared with you, only an estimated 444 would return. But gap year students are more certain in their college and career decisions. They know what they want, and they've done more research and visits to college. Not only are students more interested in colleges, but colleges can become more interested in a student. This is because their applications are likely better due to more time working on them, but also colleges will notice the extra things on a resume which can make all the difference. But let's be honest, being accepted into your dream college means nothing if you cannot pay for it, which leads me to my final point. Hey, having a year to save up for college is of course a very smart financial decision. Even working part-time can do wonders for your tuition bill. A study done by College Polls shows that 67% of college students pay entirely for their own education, and many of them struggle to do so. Because of this, I looked at my financial options so that I could have as little debt as possible. Most students don't have the time to really consider all the numbers, and I wanted to make sure that getting an education would actually help me earn money once I graduated. So then I pursued the most financially stable option I could, Musical theater. <laughs> no, but I knew I wanted to go into that, and I knew I wouldn't have a consistent income outside of college, so I took that into consideration. I also had the time to communicate with ONU and make some negotiations. This can take a while before it gets approved, so a busy high school student might not have the time. It saved me a few hundred dollars per semester, though. Beyond that, I also spent a ton of time researching for and applying for over a hundred scholarships was crazy, but without those, I simply could not attend ONU. But with all this, I was able to save and consider before committing to a lifetime of debt. Now, you may still have your doubts about why a gap year is good, and rightfully so. A lot of people think that if you take a gap year, you'll never actually go to college, and I thought this was also the case for many gap year students until just a few weeks ago. Turns out that 90% of gap year students do go to college within one year of graduating. You might also think that it's unlikely for people to really get stuff done in a gap year. And that's partially true. It does take a very self-motivated person to make the most out of it. But there are organizations that help kids plan and hold them accountable. Or maybe they've just got a mom like mine. One of the biggest fears is the feeling of falling behind, though. But when it comes down to it, the exact opposite is happening. It can be intimidating that your friends are already in college, but you are gathering the tools to excel, and the benefits are evident once you arrive at college. And personally, I think it's better to take a year off before 
before spending thousands of dollars to attend a college that you might transfer from anyway. I do want to say, gap years simply aren't for everyone, and I don't think they should be. Many college students have no doubts about their college and career decisions. Other students might realize that taking time off would genuinely distract them, and other people might not even have that option. But I do think it is really important for students to consider taking a gap year. So what do we do about it? Well, for us specifically, we can look at gap years as a more positive thing. Being more aware of the benefits could influence a younger sibling, a friend, or even future children that a gap year is for them. Or if you yourself are looking into a graduate degree, maybe you would want to consider taking your off in between that. Globally, however, I think high schools and colleges should be more supportive of gap year students by viewing them as high school seniors still. I know my high school really did not support my time off. I still had to be in contact with them about transcripts, letters of recognition, all that stuff, but there was a lack of communication because I was no longer a student. My high school also refused to put me on the scholarship mailing list, which is why I had to re research so many myself. But colleges do tend to be more open-minded to the idea unless you want to defer admission. What I mean by this is if a student does apply and get accepted to college their senior year of high school, most colleges will make them apply again after their gap year with no guarantee of getting back in. Actually, an estimated 5% of universities allow students to defer admission. Scholarships, especially, can be biased against gap year students. Someone may not be able to apply because they're not in school. They may not give a gap year student option on their forms, or in some cases, they may say to your face, you're the most eligible person for the scholarship, but how do we know you're actually going to college? That means sucked. So, if statistically, gap year students are excelling the most at their colleges and careers, why is society so against it? I encourage you to support the gap year students you might know, <laughs> and consider how slowing down a bit in any form can make you feel like a new person. Taking a gap year to focus on goals, academics, and pay is so important, and it could give students the chance to excel beyond their imagination. In short, Taking time to figure out what success looks like is a surefire way to be directed and achieving it. Thank you. Hello again. So uh, my second student of the evening is Allison Bach. Um, Allison is a psychology major with a minor in international studies and she hails from Twinsburg, Ohio. Um, in her spare time she likes pencil drawing as well as listening or watching I should say foreign TV shows. So I'd like to welcome Allison to the stage. Cases of those wrongfully incarcerated. 
Shapiro, mentioned previously, defines a wrongful conviction as those who are factually innocent, meaning that someone else committed the crime or that there was no crime committed at all. Those wrongly imprisoned may end up spending years or even decades incarcerated with no way to prove their innocence, which not only impacts that individual, but also their friends, family, and even the community. Samuel R. Gross and colleagues at the University of Michigan Law School writes about cases that show these negative impacts, specifically in regards to people of color. For example, in 1984, two African-American brothers, 19-year-old and 15-year-old, with intellectual disabilities falsely confessed to the murder of a minor and were sentenced to death. In 2010, they were exonerated, but that doesn't get rid of the decades these brothers and their, family, their surrounding families that are trying to reach out. Shapiro also states that in the United States, thousands to tens of thousands of people are wrongfully convicted each year. She goes into detail of the U.S. adversarial system in which the court operates of the prosecution against the defense. This system is meant to make a trial fair and sentence the person without a shadow of doubt. However, the University of Michigan Law School professor Catherine Jensen explains, wrongful convictions often occur as a result of incentivized testimony from witnesses, false confessions, eyewitness identification error, bad lawyering, government misconduct, and faulty forensic science. In fact, research again by Shapiro has shown that more than 75% of wrongful conviction cases that led to exoneration of my DNA evidence involved eyewitness misidentification. Judson also discusses how bias impacts those wrong those wrong makers, specifically confirmation bias, television bias, and context bias. Confirmation of bias occurs when investigators form a hypothesis of guilt early in the evaluation of evidence. Tunnel vision bias is when investigators hone in on one suspect rather than others. And context bias is the tendency for consideration to be influenced by background information. These biases seem to contribute to the disproportionate impact of wrongful convictions on people of color in the U.S., with black Americans being seven times more likely than white Americans to be falsely convicted of serious crimes. According to Samuel Gross, and how was mentioned earlier. However, while these minority groups have been impacted to a larger extent, anybody can be falsely convicted of a crime at any point. So what can we do about it? One organization who fights for innocent prisoners and also works to prevent future wrongful convictions is the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project's about page, about page explains that it, it is an independent, nonprofit organization that was founded in 1992. Their mission is to free the innocent from wrongful convictions through the use of DNA evidence and law, while also transferring, also transforming the systems responsible for those unjust incarcerations. Emily West at the CUNY Institute for State and Local Governments and Vanessa Ratuga at the Innocence Project conducted an in-depth analysis of the first 25 years of the global Innocence Project data utilizing DNA. This comprehensive report shows that from 1989 to 2014, in the United States, the Innocence Project helped to exonerate 325 prisoners who had been wrongfully incarcerated. West and Ratuga state that DNA testing is the only forensic discipline that has been recognized as a scientifically valid and reliable method of differentiating individuals, making DNA a preeminent way to free those that just incarcerated. Additionally, West and Ratuga's report talks about what the Innocence Project does for those after they are free. Since it has shown that reintegrating into society after so many years behind bars is difficult. The primary method of helping those individuals is through providing compensation. This helps them to rebuild their lives by providing for basic needs and psychological, psychological treatment. If you donate to the Innocence Project, then more individuals who are wrongfully convicted will be set free using improved DNA evidence. This in turn helps people recognize that there is a problem with unjust convictions which pushes the criminal justice systems responsible to ensure fair trials and investigations through the use of comprehensive and undeniable proof instead of bias and subjectivity or errors made with witness testimonies and forensic science. Let me tell you the story of Margaret Anderson. July 17, 1982 was just a normal day for 18-year-old Marvin Lamont Anderson. A nice summer day in Virginia, with the sun beckoning people to come out and enjoy the weather, will end up being the worst day for Anderson in the 
This young woman had been abducted, raped, and robbed by an African American man who she said was a total stranger. Marvin Anderson was quickly seen as a suspect to join the lineup for the victim to the act. What he didn't know was that he never stood a chance. The police had given her seven photos previously to look through, and in the lineup, he was the only person who was in that original photo of the show. The only forensic evidence that was taken by the Virginia Bureau of Forensic Science was unimportant. To make matters worse, the community knew that the most likely suspect was a different black man named John Lewis London, who had stolen the bicycle from the victim's shoes that she saw during the crime. Anderson requested and pleaded for the owner of the bike of London to be witnesses, but was denied. After only a two-hour trial in an all-white jury, Deliberating for four to five minutes, Marvin Anderson was convicted on all counts and sentenced to 210 years in prison, being caged like an animal for something he did not do. Anderson contacted the Innocence Project in 1994, and in 2001, some physical evidence was found after all was thought to be lost. Marvin Anderson finally had some hope. Lo and behold, the results matched two inmates one of whom was John Lewis London, and the other excluded Anderson, finally proving his innocence. So on August 22, 2002, Margaret Anderson was given full pardon after spending 15 years in prison and an additional four years on parole. Now, Margaret Anderson is living out his childhood dream of becoming a firefighter, where he serves as chief of the Hanover, Virginia Fire Department. On top of this, he serves on the board of directors for the Innocence Project and is the father of three beautiful children. Marvin Anderson finally has a happy ending thanks to the help of the Innocence Project. To conclude, in the United States, there are more of those who are wrongfully convicted than there should ever be. Factors that go into this are errors of witnesses or testimonies, government misconduct, faulty forensic science, and even bias. In order to remedy this, you should donate to the Innocence Project. Doing so will help provide aid to those who are innocent, specifically through DNA and exoneration. It can also help protect everybody's safety by reducing the amount of those wrongfully convicted to begin with. On the screen, there is a QR code that when scanned will go to the Innocence Project's donation page to make it quick and easy to make a one-time donation. In addition, there are monthly donation options available on the same website if you are interested. Remember Marvin Anderson. Remember that there are so many more in similar situations. Remember that this could happen to you. It isn't guilty until proven. It isn't guilty until proven innocent. It's supposed to be the opposite. Welcome to the stage, Ki Utsaga. He is a, a freshman and majoring in computer sciences, and she is a self-described, how should I say this? Self-described nerd. <laughs> I prefer uh, cultural uh, studies of pop culture or something like that. But she loves DC, Marvel, Harry Potter, I do too, so I guess I consider myself a nerd as well. Uh, he is from Zimbabwe, and uh, she's going to, uh, she's a freshman, but she's become very strong and, and offers a very powerful voice for advocacy. So I'll let her uh, introduce her subject.
following presentation includes topics of child abuse, physical violence, and brief mentions of sexual abuse. Hello, my name is Kibit Sago, and my presentation is about child abuse and the effects that it has on us and the youth of today. There are many people who can recall having an exciting childhood, one filled with laughter and endless joy. But what about the people who cannot recall such happy memories? The children of the past who have their childhoods stripped away from them. The ones who can only remember the trauma, the suffering, and the endless feelings of neglect. As someone who is still fighting battles of emotional and physical distress due to exposure to abuse in my youth, I want to bring more attention to this topic, as it is my goal to break that endless cycle of violence and emotional neglect towards children of all ages. April was known as Child Abuse Prevention Month, so there is no better time than now to provide you all with the necessary information that I hope will encourage you to seek out help if you notice a child in a dangerous situation or in a difficult situation, and to understand how abuse will affect them and others throughout their lives. That being said, today I'll be discussing these topics, and I'll also be discussing three areas in life that can be ruined due to abuse that occurs in childhood, which are mental health, school performance, and relationships. Here is a slide with the continued topics that I will be discussing today. But before we get into that, here is some necessary information that I want to give that I want to give insight on the situation just a little bit more. In 1960s, when when child abuse started being talked about more amongst the public, the federal government still had not done much to instill laws that protected children from who were suffering from maltreatment. Even a previous U.S. senator, even a previous U.S. senator, and former Vice President Walter Mondale stated in 1973 that nowhere in the federal government could we find one official signed full time to the prevention, identification, and treatment of child abuse and neglect. Then, due to his efforts in 1974, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, known as CAPTA, was passed in Congress. Although this was a big step in the right direction, Congress still cared more about preserving families than they did about protecting children. And according to a short book that I read titled, A Short History of Child Protection in America by John E. B. Myers, it states that by the late 1970s, that the rising number of children in long-term foster care set off alarm bells in Congress, resulting in the passage of the Adoption Assistance and the Child Welfare Act of 1980. The act required states to make reasonable efforts to avoid removing children from maltreating parents. I believe that wanting to preserve families more than wanting to help a child out, help a child out of an abusive situation is purely unethical, to say the least. Here is more information that I found that are from the World Health Organization. 60% of children ages 2 through 14 suffer physical punishment from parents, teachers, and caregivers. And one in two children ages 6 through 17 live in country, countries where corporal punishment is not prohibited. Here are a few more surprising statistics. According to the UNICEF, around 15 million girls between ages of 15 and 19 have experienced non-consensual non sex. And also, according to the CDC, in 2020 they stated that in the U.S. alone, more than 1,700 children died from abuse, neglect, or a combination of the two. So I want to emphasize extremely that still not enough is being done to protect the children of today, and there is something that seriously needs to be done about it. As I stated before, I too am a victim of various kinds of abuse that happened to me in my childhood. And it greatly affected not only my physical health, but my mental health and emotional well-being. Just two months after my 18th birthday, I was diagnosed with 
bipolar 1 disorder, and major depressive disorder. That being said, it is a known fact that adolescents and young adults who experience continued ill treatment are more likely to develop various brain damage or low brain activity levels, mental disorders, and other effects that can affect them long term and later in their life, such as alcohol and drug abuse. In addition, in April of 2015, the Child Welfare Information Gateway released a newspaper article that stated the following. Adults who are maltreated may have reduced volume in the hippocampus, which is central to learning and memory, have decreased volume in their corpus callosum, which is responsible for interhemisphere communication and other processes, like arousal, emotion, and higher cognitive abilities, which you should keep in mind, and also tend to have decreased volume in their cerebellum, which helps coordinate motor behavior and executive functioning. Following that, the Nationwide Children's Hospital released an article that lists the types of disorders and or illnesses a child will most likely develop if exposed to long-term maltreatment, which include the following. Depression, anxiety, eating disorders, ADHD, and sleep issues, and many others. Such abuse can even cause kids to want to commit suicide if they feel that they are in a hopeless or unescapable situation. And now for my second point, which is about school performance. Since we just previously learned that physical and emotional harm can cause children to develop problems within the brain, it should be no surprise that it would be harder for them to focus in school because many of them can and most likely will develop difficulty learning, could have low grades, and may even struggle to get a job in the future. In fact, according to CASA, court-appointed specialists for children. Mistreated children have a greater instance of exhibiting poor social skills and classroom behavior problems. Maltreatment in the first five years of life nearly triples a child's likelihood of having academic problems. These children are far likelier to drop out of school before completing high school. And if I'm being completely honest, I myself would have not graduated from high school. If I didn't end up receiving help from school counselors and teachers who are very understanding of my ongoing problems that happened through my high school career. And for my last point, abuse can affect the relationships children have with themselves and their parents slash guardians. They may even have difficulty making friends or choosing the right group of friends, such as people who don't really care about them and may even grow up feeling extremely lonely even in their adult years. Nationwide Children's Hospital acknowledges this in their article about the impact on physical abuse on adolescents by saying this, many abused children may distress others. Children who have suffered long-term abuse may struggle with basic social skills and have difficulty communicating naturally as other children can. I know that for me, I struggled, make, I struggled making friends all throughout middle school and high school. And even when I came to, you, to ONU in the fall, I didn't know who to trust or who to become friends with because it gave me extreme anxiety and depression as I thought that I would never be able to get out of this long-term period of complete isolation and loneliness from the world. I often blamed myself for the abuse that was done to me in my childhood and isolated myself from people as they got close to me in fear that they might find out about what happened to me in my childhood and might not understand me or how I function as a person. Here are a few rebuttal points. So when I was a child, I was told a couple things from the Bible that kind of that I don't agree with today, but the Bible was used against me. So Proverbs 13 verse 24 states that whoever spares the rod hates their child, but the one who uses their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. So I know a couple people who use this verse against me and other kids to justify why they abuse someone 
And I just really think that it's unethical. And a second point that a lot of people make is maltreatment in the foster care system. A lot of people say that removing a child from their home will not help them, as there is also maltreatment that can happen to them in the foster care system. Well, obviously, we need to do a better job of identifying people and making sure that they actually really do want to help children and are not there to cause any harm to them. And three, a lot of people say, a lot of people justify abuse by saying, oh, I came out just fine because they experienced abuse in their childhood. So they think it's okay to also abuse kids for wrongdoings or other stuff. And I really think that it's just redundant because if you say stuff like that, it's like, did you really come out fine now? I don't think so. And now I'll be giving you some signs and I'll be giving you some signs about how to help. So first you need to know the signs. And bruises that are difficult for children to explain to you or they or it might be unbelievable when they are when they have bruises on themselves is a sign. Patterns in these bruises and also children who aren't receiving Medicare, medical care for bruises that show up on their body. And children who might also be covering up their marks of abuse or even self-harm by wearing long sleeves or jackets, specifically on hot days. A second one is watch your behavior and be an example. A lot of people don't know how to watch their, watch their behavior when they are around children. And we need to do better. Three, donate and support prevention organizations. And four, protect your children, your cousins, siblings, and nephews, and teach them their rights. And five, act now. Volunteer and educate yourselves and others. So, in conclusion, the problem that I gave you today was that kids are still suffering from abuse and mistreatment, which causes them severe trauma, struggles in school, forming relationships and or distant relationships, and we must put an end to it. And the solution that I presented you here with you today is that to stop the un ongoing cycle of abuse, we can educate ourselves. We can have the courage to protect our loved ones and even ourselves and if applicable, report abuse. Get in contact with a trusted adult or organization that will be able to save this child's life. And lastly, I wanted to leave you with a quote from a TV show that you might be familiar with. It's from One Tree Hill. It goes something like this. Sometimes life will kick you around, but sooner or later, you will realize that you are not just a survivor. You are a warrior, and you are stronger than anything life throws your way. If you are a survivor of any kind of abuse, just know that there are people out there who care about you. Your story matters, their story matters, and our stories matter. Thank you.
Before we move any further, I would like us all to come to an agreement on one simple truth. And that is that, generally speaking, a majority of the time, failure is not as detrimental as we may think it is. To prove this, I'd like to perform a study right here, right now. I will be the conductor and you all my very willing participants. Everyone here is something to someone else. A brother, sister, daughter, son, mentor, student, athlete, friend. I want you to pick one of these relationships and think of a time where you failed. Like that. You flunked a final exam, you got on stage and forgot your lines, or you said the wrong thing at the wrong time and picked a nasty fight with a loved one. I want you to remember how that felt, the heat behind your eyes, the weight on your shoulders. I want you to remember how it felt like the world was crumbling beneath your feet. Now I want you to look down. Is the earth still there? Now, a little cheesy, but I want us all to understand that failure is never insurmountable, as difficult as that may be to accept. All of us in this room have yet to encounter a failure that we could not get past in some way, shape, or form. Why is this important to understand? Because failure is always teaching you something. Now, that may seem a little bit backwards. You might think getting an F on an assignment isn't helping me learn anything in my classes. And while, yes, getting an F on a final exam might not help you learn anything about the actual material that was covered, it actually teaches you a lot about yourself, like your education style, your test-taking abilities, your study habits, what worked and what didn't work. Think back to that activity we just did. Remember the events and the actions that led to that failure. Have you made those same mistakes? Probably not. This might explain why Steve Jobs finished high school with a 2.65 GPA. J.K. Rowling graduated from the university with a roughly C minus average, and why the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. only got one A in his four years at university. These people understand that pursuing an education is about so much more than just getting straight A's. In fact, organizational psychologist Adam Grant puts it like this. All have joined the cult of perfectionism out of conviction that getting top marks are a ticket to elite graduate schools and lucrative job offers. Yes, straight A students have mastered cramming information and regurgitating it on exams. But career success is rarely about finding the right solution to a problem. It's more about finding the right problem to solve. Now, what would you think if I told you that somewhat frequent failure is actually beneficial for your mental health? Let's say you have an irrational fear. Let's say water, bodies of water. If you were to go to a behavioral therapist, what would their course of action be? Exposure therapy. In small, controlled environments, you'd be exposed to bodies of water. Over time, the idea of water becomes less overwhelming, and eventually, it doesn't consume your life. Why should failure be treated any differently? We say a fear of water is irrational because water is an unavoidable part of life. You're gonna experience it at some point. The same goes for failure. The more you are exposed to it in reasonable amounts, the less overwhelming it becomes. When it's less overwhelming, it's a less detrimental part of our progressional psyche, allowing us to focus more on how to actually improve rather than just how to avoid failing. On the opposite end, let's talk about perfectionism. First, let's define it. Perfectionism is not motivation. It's not wanting to do well academically. And it is not working hard to achieve a goal. The Oxford definition of perfectionism is the absolute refusal to accept any standard short of perfection. Now let's clear up one thing. Perfectionism is not a mental illness. It's just a personality trait. You don't need to be diagnosed with it. You just know if you have it. Now, while we can accept that it is kind of a flaw, it's often seen as a superior flaw to have. The most common example being the job interviewer asking, what is your biggest weakness? To which the interviewee replies, I tend to be a perfectionist. While we often use perfectionism as a subtle boast about our hardworking capabilities, real perfectionism actually has some serious drawbacks. Psychology Today describes perfectionism as a tendency to avoid challenges 
rigid, all or nothing thinking, toxic comparisons, and a lack of creativity. Perfectionists tend to not believe in unconditional love. They expect others' affection and approval to be dependent on flawless performance. Perfectionism can often be accompanied by depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorders, eating disorders, and even suicidal impulses. While this is a very drastic manifestation of perfectionism, there are very real possibilities when dealing with it. Now, some might argue that perfectionism results in perfect work. Simply put, if I refuse to produce anything less than perfect, I will never fail. And if I never fail, I will always succeed. But actually, perfectionism just results in procrastination. Perfectionism exemplifies the negative emotions that we experience with failure. As a way to delay the onset of these emotions, we procrastinate whatever work it is that actually needs to be done. The more we procrastinate our work, the less time we actually have to put effort into it, increasing the likelihood of failure. See how that works? Now, am I telling you to start skipping the rest of your classes and fail all your final exams and stop trying in your athletic games and matches? Unfortunately, no. I am telling you to take risks. Get out of your comfort zone. Start doing things that you normally wouldn't for the fear of failure. Stop insisting on being perfect and start focus on just being. Now, I'd like to leave you with a quote from famous failure, J.K. Rowling. It is impossible to live without failing at something, unless, of course, you live so cautiously that you may, might as well not have lived at all, in which case you have failed by default. So get out there and start failing. Thank you.